mid-season and out of season. I've been called at the last minute to have a message for you tonight, but really it's not my message. Yeah, the Holy Ghost, Jesus himself, still has a message, and it's in his word. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to share? I was looking through my notes and other things. Lord, what do you want me to share? And I came across uh, something that I had prepared a while ago. It's been a while since I talked on it, but it's really, it's still in this word. So we'll see how it goes. I'm going to pray. And let's begin. If you have your Bibles, please break them out. I'll have also up on the screen for you to read it there. But at least you should have something in your hands, tangible, that you can feel. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, it is not by my mind, nor by, by my power. It is by thy Holy Spirit, God, that this word is here. You inspired it. Inspire each one here, God, by that same word. I know you have a message for each one of us that applies to us individually and applies to each one of us as your people, as your church, as your family. Speak to my own heart, God. Help me. Move my hands from my own eyes. And my fingers from my own ears. That I might unblock the way of my own heart, God. That I might receive you tonight. That each one of us may receive you. Help us, Father God. We pray, we ask, in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please open to the first book of Galatians, the first chapter of the book of Galatians. And also have it on the screen, but I, you really should have a Bible in your hands. I love this little Bible. I usually carry it with me everywhere I go. It's a little small for me to get older, eyes, you know, squinting, but I love it. And we're just going to read chapter 1. And then we'll go back over it, okay? Does that sound okay? Yes. Chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1. There's power in Galatians 1. There's power in Galatians 1. So we're just going to read it first. And just follow me through. Here we go. Ready? Yeah. No, not ready? I'll wait. Okay, I'm ready. Do I have any hands on this side? You ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. If not, at least read it up on the screen, and hopefully that's big enough for you. Okay. It says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ. And God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for our sin. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. According to the will of God and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. Unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men, or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. For I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion. Above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past, now preached the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. As I began to think about what Galatians was really about, 
And if you go back to the 1888 messages and righteousness by faith, which is really, we really theorize it, we theologize it more than really experience it. We talk about it, but do we know what it means? What is righteousness by faith? What is in the book of Galatians? What does it mean to us? Why did Paul write this? And so the title of the sermon is really, Oh Foolish Galatians. And I really thought, Lord, am I really that foolish? Have I really understood or have I not understood? So Paul is really writing to me. He's writing to each one of us. So what is the letter of Galatians addressing more so than anything? What is in Galatians chapter 1? What does it really start? What was Paul's point in Galatians 1? Anybody have an idea? It's the what? Yeah, it is the gospel. You have to ask yourself, what is the gospel? Because in, in Galatians, he mentions at least two gospels, right? He mentions the real gospel, and that which is so-called another gospel, which is really not another, he says. So there is the real gospel in the world, and there's something which is counterfeiting it, something which is looking like the gospel, but it's not really it. It's fool's gold, right? Not the real gold. Not the real gold of character, of faith, and love. It's something else. So, the letter of Galatians, you should really read it with the letter of Romans, but I don't have time to get into Romans or even the book of Hebrews. They really all tie together. But it's really about the true and everlasting gospel. So let's take a look at Galatians 1.1 1, 1 all over again. Let's start at the beginning. And just go through it. And as I began to underline each word, every word became important. And the most important word in the entire book of Galatians was found right in the first verse and the first word of that verse. What's the first word? Paul. Paul. And I thought, yeah, that's what the gospel's about. It's about that very name. It's about that very person. It's about what the gospel did in his own life. And that's what he starts with in Galatians 1. He's showing, look, I'm not really talking about a theory. I'm not talking about words on paper. I'm talking about the demonstration of God in my own life and what it's done for me. Let me tell you all about him. So the very first word, Paul, itself is preaching the gospel because it had a change in his whole life. He was no longer what he once was. He's somebody entirely new. So Paul knew by experience what he was talking about was a theory to him. And that's what he was really trying to give over to other people. He's like, look, I'm not talking about something on paper. It's not something I can theorize. No, no, no. I've experienced it for myself. So Paul, what are the next two words? An apostle. What does the word apostle mean? We know what disciple means, right? Someone who's following somebody else. That's why Jesus said, come, follow me, be a disciple. But what does apostle mean? First I come to Christ, and then I go. I go for Christ. Apostle means someone who is sent. So first he comes to Christ, and then he is sent for Christ. So Paul himself is the gospel message in body. Even if he had no book with him, if he had no scroll, Paul could tell others about what the gospel was doing where? In him. That's why he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and elsewhere that you aren't, aren't you know that you're living epistles? You are the living letter sent from God to others. You are that gospel written down. It is the law written upon the heart, upon the mind. And so Paul says, let me show you about the example first in me. Before you can tell about other people's examples, shouldn't you yourself have experienced it? You yourself should have been given a new name. You yourself should have been raised from the dead. You yourself should have had old things passed away as Paul has done. Your old ways. And now you're somebody new. Now you're, you're talking about Jesus. Paul's whole mission was to tell people about Jesus. But first he had to tell them how it happened in him. So we have Paul and apostles. Someone who was sent. Don't you know that you ought to be sent? Do you know who you're sent for? If you're not sent for God, if you're not sent for Christ... You're being sent by someone else, and you're carrying another message. You're carrying another experience. You're carrying another gospel, right? Notice what it says. He says, he didn't receive it of men, and it was neither by man. But who did he receive it by? Jesus. 
He received it directly by Jesus Christ. Remember Paul on the road to Damascus, who was Saul? Right? Jesus Christ gave it to him directly. And you too can experience that directly. Do you realize that nobody really came to my door knocking? I mean, you always have those witnesses or L LDS or maybe a few of Baptists here and there, or maybe the Son of Adams if you're lucky. Right? But Jesus Christ was the one that came to me and knocked on my own heart. He was the one that came to me knocking and calling. Amen. And he'd been calling me for 30 odd years, even though I was born and raised in another religion, which was Roman Catholicism. But I didn't really know Christ. And I'm not saying you can't be a Christian as a Catholic. What I'm saying is, I didn't know. He came to me personally. And so I have my own testimony. I can tell you it's true, it's real, just as Paul told you. So I didn't receive it by man, and neither of men, but by Jesus Christ, through the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost walks these halls, don't you know? Notice what it says. Not by men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him, that is Christ, from the dead. And if he raised his own son from the dead, how much more shall he raise us from the dead who are in Christ? You want to be in Christ. He'll raise you from the dead. First spiritually, to prepare you for the new heavens and the new earth. And if you happen to be physically dead, he'll also raise you too. It's a promise of his own son. So he sets before us the word of the apostle. He sets before us the very true and ever everlasting gospel. It tells about the savior of the world, the deliverer and redeemer. Was Paul not redeemed? Was Paul not saved? See, we talk about a savior of the world, but if he hasn't saved us, have we really entered into that experience? No. You can tell people about the savior, Jesus, but they can tell whether you've been saved or not. They can tell whether I've been saved. So if I'm going preaching about the savior of the world and I'm still doing those things of the world, cussing and swearing and adultery, drinking alcohol and all that other stuff that goes with it, you, you fill in the blank. They can tell. And they can tell that I have another gospel, some other news. Like, I heard that news. I need the real news. I need the real gospel in Jesus Christ. So Paul, you notice he, he talks about this Christ, Jesus, the what? The Christ. What does Christ mean? It means anointed. This is what the word Messiah means in Hebrew, right? Messiah and Christ in Greek, right? He's anointed. So he talks about the Holy One of Israel, the desire of all nations. Is he your desire? We have this book, Desire of Ages, but have you ever read it? I tell you, read that. If you haven't read it, go online to YouTube. We have it on there. It's on audio form. Listen to it. It will move you. Paul, when he was talking in the book of Galatians, his whole point was to speak about the desire of nations, the desire of his own life, what it meant to him, to others. He talked about the one who was promised and the hope of glory. Paul knew what it meant to hope. Notice Paul is not writing to the Galatians alone. Let me uh, go back up the previous verse, please. Make sure it's on screen. Uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. There you go. Notice what it says in verse 2. Notice, it first it's Paul, and then verse 2 says, and all the which are with me. So Paul wasn't really talking about his own experience alone. He was also saying, look, look at all these other people that have the same experience that I have in Jesus Christ. So it's Paul and all the brethren unto you. So it wasn't just one fluke. It wasn't just said, oh, Paul, you're crazy. Something happened. You got hit in the head by a rock, <clears throat> right, because he fell on the ground. No. There are many brethren that have the same experience as Paul. And the question is, do you? Do you have that experience? Because if you do, then you're with him. You're with Paul. You're with the brethren that have that same experience. You're with Jesus Christ. Yeah. So who are you brethren of, first and foremost? Who is your brother in that verse, first and foremost? Christ. Jesus. Jesus Christ. Hence we pray that prayer, our Father. And we only have that relationship to our Father through who? 
Jesus. Jesus Christ, which means he's our brother. He's the first brother. So when he says, and all the brethren which are with me, wasn't Jesus Christ with Paul? In spirit and in truth? Yeah. It's more than just people down here. Even all the heavenly angels are your brethren. If you're in Christ. It says, for in Christ is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there bond nor free, neither is there male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Reading out of the text. And how can you be one with Christ unless you are agreed with him? The Bible says, can two walk together except they be? Agreed, right? So what are we doing? Can we walk with Paul? Can we agree with Paul? Can we walk with Jesus? Are we agreed with Jesus? Notice what he says in the next verse, verse 3. I'm going to raise verse 3 up just a little bit. Thank you, that's good. That's good. That's good. It says, Grace and to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. What are the two words in there that are being sent unto you? Grace and peace. Grace and peace. You ever, you ever question yourself, why does Paul always start out his letters with grace and peace? It's not just like, hey, hello. It's not just a, a normal salutation. He's telling you something about the gospel that he's experienced. What's the first word? Grace. What do you need? Grace. What do you need grace for? Why did you need grace? Because I'm a sinner. I needed grace. He's telling you something about the very gospel itself. I need grace. So that means if I needed grace, what do I automatically admit about myself? I'm a sinner. See the word itself? He's telling you something powerful about the gospel and how it changed his life. So what was the first thing Paul had to admit? He was a sinner. Because he first he thought he was righteous. If he thought he was righteous, did he ever need grace? No. So this is one of the problems that we as Seventh-day Adventists have among others because we teach the law, which is true. But we lean way too heavily upon law. We don't focus on grace doesn't mean the law isn't important. But do you realize that the very law of God starts with grace? What's Exodus chapter 20 verse 2 say? For I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. What is that? That's grace. He says, I, the Lord, saved you out from it. That's grace. So the very law of God starts with grace. If we don't preach it that way, we got it upside down. And then Exodus 20 verse 6. He says, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. He says, and showing mercy. What's that? So the very heart of the law, besides justice in the previous verse, is also grace. So it says, grace be to you. And what? Peace. Why do we need peace? He's sending peace. So did we need peace? Yes. So what, what did we have before if we didn't have peace? What's that word? War. war. Who were we at war with? The devil. Everyone except the devil. We were on his side. That means we were at war with God. We were at war with all goodness. We were at war with righteousness. We were at war with one another. We were at war with all that which is holy. We were at war with all of that, but with Satan, we were on his side. We were at enmity with God, as the book of Romans says. But now he says... Grace and peace. peace. He says, be at peace with your Father which is in heaven. Yeah. And he tells you who? Through Lord Jesus Christ. It is Christ which has brought us peace. It's brought us back into harmony with our Father which is in heaven. He was the grace sent down. Yes? He's telling you something about the gospel that he himself experienced. So Paul experienced that grace and he experienced that peace. Through Jesus Christ. For himself. He thought he was at peace before. But he says, but then the law came and sin revived and I died. He was really at war. And that peace is really that gospel. I'm wondering what the angel said when he first came down and spoke to Elizabeth and Mary in Luke chapter 2, 14. You don't have to turn there. It says, glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace. 
goodwill toward men. He's talking about the gospel. Because there is another gospel in the world, as in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, I want to say verse 14, if I remember right. He tells you that there's another on earth. And it says, by peace, he's destroying many. What did we just link peace to? To Jesus, who is the gospel, right? That means that other system has another gospel. By their preaching of peace, it's a false peace. And through it, he's destroying many. So you've got to ask yourself, do you really have peace with Jesus Christ? Do you have the real gospel? And you can tell right away. If we have worry and anxiety and fear and doubt, what don't we have? Peace. We don't have peace. That means we're missing somebody. Jesus Christ. We don't have the real gospel. And I'm not talking about moments where the devil tempts you into something. I'm talking about a constant worrying fear. A constant doubting. You're never at peace. You're never sure. I'm not talking about those moments where the devil really tries to wrestle with your faith. We all go through that. All I can tell you is, cling. Cling. Stay nailed. Take a look at verse 4. So Paul brings you the everlasting gospel right in view in verse 4. It says, what? Isn't that the gospel? That's the gospel right there. That he might deliver us. It's not just that, hey, he gave himself for our sins. It's not merely justification. It's not merely, hey, look, he died for me and that's it. No, it says, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Sanctification, right? Impartation of righteousness. Not really imputation. Not really it's just accredited to my account. No. He works in me to do that which is good. Which is righteous. Which is holy. He does that work in me. He's delivering me from this present evil world. Notice. According to the will of God and our Father. It is God's will for you to overcome. It is God's will for you to accept Jesus Christ. It is God's will in all of that. So if we reject it, we really reject the will of God. We're saying not thy will be done, but my will be done. That means we haven't accepted that we're really sinners. We're saying, no, I'm righteous. I'm right. I don't need you. You see the experience? We're really saying... That Paul, you're full of baloney. You don't know what you're talking about. Which is really saying the Holy Spirit is full of baloney because he was inspired, right? Inspiring Paul. So who gave himself for our sins? The Lord Jesus Christ. See verse 3? Is he really your Lord? It doesn't just say Jesus Christ, does it? It says Lord, which is ruler, king. Which means I have to acknowledge I am the subject. And if I don't, I'm really saying I'm king or someone else is king. Right, king? <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. It says, what compelled him to give himself completely for his sins? What compelled him? What's the compelling character of God? The will of God. So then it was love that compelled him, wasn't it? If it's not love that's compelling us to do things, it's another motive. It's something else. It's another gospel. It's another character. We might say, well, my parents compelled me to be here. That's not really love. You say, I want to be here. There it is love. And so, what compels us to really go for God? Should it be the same motive? Because notice it says, it's absolute love. It says, while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. Notice, while we were yet sinners. Paul is setting the true and everlasting gospel before us all. What real love is. We've already talked about deliverance of sin. Notice the last part. It says, glory. Right? Glory. Verse 5. It says, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Because of what he did. Not because of anything we ever did. The greatest gift, the greatest sacrifice, the greatest everything was given by the Father to us in Christ Jesus. 
That's why he deserves all the glory, all the credit, all the honor, all the praise, all the thanksgiving, all the might. It's his. So if we come along and say, no, we really need to take glory to ourselves, or we need to take that honor to ourselves and preach me and do this, look what I did, we're preaching another gospel. We're not submitted to the real gospel yet. Because we would lay our glory down in the dust where it belongs. Because we're dust. Nothing. I can't even breathe on my own without God. That was a gift from God. Another gift from God. Every moment that I live, it's a gift from God. Every moment that you live, it's a gift from God. How can I take credit for any of it? How can I take any glory? How many Gospels are there then? One. There's only one. So what does it mean that we followed another Gospel, which is not another? Take a look at the text. And we can scroll up a little bit, please. Do verses 6, 7, and 8. right there on the side. Can you see it? Right here. There's a little arrow right here. There you go. I know it's hard to see back there. All right. Like I said, I didn't have a PowerPoint ready, so this is the next best thing. Notice what he says. He says, I marvel. What did the word marvel? marvel. To wonder, right? Let's say it's a miracle or something, right? I marvel. He's like, I'm astounded. I can't believe it. That ye are so soon removed from him. Notice, not a theology, from the person. You're removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. That means we've actually been separated from the Father if we believe in another gospel. Because he's the one that called us into the grace of the gospel of Christ. And what separates you from your Father? He says, because you were sins have separated between you and God. That another gospel teaches what? Sin. sin. So if we live in sin, we're really living in another gospel. That's what separates us. That's why we're so soon removed. Our beliefs do matter. Your belief brings you to actions. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He says, which is not another. So there really is only one gospel. This one is merely fake. It's in a mirage. It's an illusion. It's not really there. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole um, physical circumcision thing, which is really what this is talking about. We're talking about other things, the spiritual aspect of what's going on. Are there those in the world that pervert the gospel of Christ? Yeah, they teach something else. They don't teach victory over sin. They teach, oh, you go ahead and live in your sin. Christ will figure it out when he returns. And I just talked to some other people today. They don't even believe Jesus Christ is returning. Physically. They believe it's all spiritual. He's returned already. It's now. It's done. That's a denial of the physical resurrection. It's a denial of the second coming of Jesus. So yes, there are people that teach that. I just talked to them about an hour ago. And they haven't changed their mind. Notice what it says. Oh, back please. Galatians, Galatians chapter 1. Or on the left, all the way to the left. It'll say G-A-L in the middle. Can you see it? Up, 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 up. Up, a little bit more, right there. Right there. And then go back, click on one at the top. And then if we can just scroll back down to it. Because what you did is you clicked one of them little banners. It obviously takes you to John 3.16. Oh, it Which is a great verse, by the way. All right, notice what it says. Uh, up a little bit more. One more. That's good right there. Notice what it says. It says, which is not another, but there be some to trouble you. It says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let it be what? Cursed. How do you get cursed in the Bible? Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Because if we reject what Jesus Christ has done for us, then we deserve that death. Let him be a curse. Let him be put to death on a tree. And that's exactly what's going to happen to the old man of sin and everything that we should have put away, right? Even when this world passes, I can't wait. Fine, it's all going to be gone. No more of that temptation stuff. 
It says, but though we or a what from heaven? Angel. Angel from heaven. And we usually think, you know, a glorified being is Gabriel coming down, clothed with the panoply of heaven as he touches the earth. It shakes with might, right? But there's other meanings in the word angel in the Bible. Yes, it does mean that. So even if a glowing being appears to you and preaches something other than victory over sin through Christ Jesus, right? Ignore him, go right to the real one. But what else is an angel in the Bible? A messenger. A what? A messenger. A messenger. You know that in the book of Thessalonians it talks about that even Satan himself can be transformed into an angel of light and how much more his ministers, right? So are ministers also associated with angels? Mm -hmm. That means even human beings that come as a messenger from God. They claim to be from heaven, like some of these pastors that you see on TV that preach nothing but fluff. It's air. It's empty. Air. It's illusion. Preaching the gospel. Let him be a Christ. Yeah. They have something coming. That's why we ought to know what the real gospel is. If we don't want victory over sin, you will accept a false gospel because it preaches to the carnal heart. You want no victory over sin. I want no victory over sin if that's really where I'm going. And I'll accept their gospel just like that. And it doesn't have to be a preacher of Christianity. It could be Buddhism. It could be anything. Because they preach something too. They preach another word. So beware not only of glowing beings. Beware of glowing personalities too. Right? <laughs> TV. Notice what it says in verse 8, verse 9, and verse 11. So we scroll up just a little bit more, please, if we can. That's good right there. That's good. Because in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, 9, and 11, it says, The gospel which we have preached, the gospel that you received, the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, right? The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. So there is preaching to do, but how do we preach mainly? Are we to only preach the gospel maybe like one hour a day? No. So how long in the day do we preach it? 24. 24, right? Yeah. Like it says, pray unceasingly or steal. So how do you live the gospel? The same way. So the way we preach is not really through my words, it's through my very actions, right? It's not like, hey, I come up to church on Sabbath and that's when I preach the gospel, like, you know, this coming Sabbath or the Sabbath of Father. No. It's every moment of every day I'm to preach that gospel. Otherwise, I'm preaching another gospel. gospel. So you got to ask yourself, and i got to ask myself, am I preaching the real gospel 24-7, or am I preaching it maybe you know 30 minutes out of the day? And then I preach another gospel the rest of the 23 hours and a half. Right? I know sleeping can give you a little slack. <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then some think Paul in Galatians tries to exonerate his position. What was Paul really exonerating in Galatians 1? Look at verse 10. It says, For do I now persuade men or God? It says, Or do I seek to please men? Notice the connection here. For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. That's powerful. Because remember the book of Daniel? And there were these servants, the master of eunuchs. Who did they serve? They served men. They served Nebuchadnezzar. They didn't fear God. He says, I fear my Lord the King. And Daniel said, I fear my Lord the King. I'm not going to eat your food. doesn't matter what your king says. I have a higher king. Notice, if I yet please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. That's serious. So we would ask ourselves, who are we pleasing throughout the day? Am I pleasing my husband, my wife, for those that are married? Am I pleasing my children, for those that are married, hopefully? <laughs> if not, you know, God's grace. <laughs> right? Do I please my teacher? Do I please my boss? Do I please, or am I really pre pleasing my real boss, my real king, my real lord, my real husband, my real, right? If I do, then I'm really the servant of him. And there am I, am I preaching the real gospel? Because I'm submitted to him. Do you see how much is in Galatians 1? There's tons. Tons of stuff in Galatians 1. Can you jump down to verse 24 for me, please? I'm not even paying attention to the time. So if I run long, please forgive me. 
Can you go back up just one, one more? Just to verse 23 and 24. There you go. Notice what this says. Because this is what Paul was doing. He says, But they, talking about the other churches, have heard only that he which persecuted us in times past, right? You gotta ask yourself, am I persecuting Christians? Or am I persecuting my own brethren and sisters in the church by gossip? Am I persecuting by saying and doing mean things to them, like deceiving them or tricking them? None of that's of the gospel. Do I say, hey, look over there, and there's nothing there? Ha ha, fooled you. You know, little kids do that? That's not the gospel. That's deception. Notice, that's persecution. You're really picking on somebody, and you're trying to make fun of them, or trying to win something, or pull something over their eyes. Christ Jesus would never do any of that. They which are only, that he which persecuted us in times past, now what? Preach it the faith. Does it mean only by words? No. It was by his very action. In fact, Paul received 40 stripes minus one. That's 39, right? Three times from the Jews. Was in a shipwreck and received beatings and received all these words against him. But yet that's what he used to do to them. So as a Christian, can I do that to other brethren and sisters in the church? Whether it's husband or wife or children or just you guys. No. I can't do that. I have to be like Jesus. If somebody strikes me on one cheek saying something mean to me, what do I got to do? Turn the other cheek. Turn the other way. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And that's what Paul was doing for them who persecuted him, that they too might become Christians. His heart wasn't, hey, destroy them who persecute me. His heart was that they might be one to the faith. More brothers and sisters in the faith. More people for the kingdom of God. More glory for God. Because if God can overturn Paul, they're like a game of fellow, right? You flip the piece and you win other pieces. Not like chess where you take the piece and you kick him out of the game. No, no, no. He says, I'm flipping you. Now you're mine. Now you're from my kingdom. Now go with others. Much greater is it when you convert a general from the other army. You get all the intel. Right? It's greater. And so God can point to Satan and say, see? He's mine now. He used to work for you. He used to persecute for you, but now he's suffering for me. You're the one persecuting me. Notice what it says. It says, and they, that is the whole church body, what they do? God, where? In, me. In Paul. They understood the gospel itself. Yeah, God saves. Look what he did to this man who persecuted us. They didn't really have it as letters in a book, which they did have. They had the living demonstration of a man converted by the power of the Holy Ghost. No longer persecuting them, but now taking it one for the team. I'm telling you, this powerful stuff. What is this verse? Hold on, I'm going to flip to one verse here. Make sure I got my notes here. I don't have all my notes in order. Ah, here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 2. You don't have to turn there, but if you remember it, 1 Corinthians 2 2. This is the example of Paul. He says, For I, that is Paul, determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him, what? Crucified. Crucified. What does it mean? I, I didn't want anything else known among you. I'm not teaching you anything else. Not really through words, but where? In demonstration and in power. As it goes in spirit and in truth, or in deed. So when Paul was among them, do you think they were looking at his life and his example, how he was living among them while he was preaching stuff? Uh -huh. Yeah. So what does it look like in your family, in your own home? I could ask myself this question. I'm not here to pick on anybody. I don't, you know, I don't know. But the angels write it down. The angel knows what I do. Well, you know, you guys aren't watching. Right? It's all recorded. So am I preaching the gospel by what I'm doing and saying, even thinking? Get to that level. So in your own family, as Paul, are you causing it to, to, to not preach anything else other than Jesus Christ? You're not making known anything else. You're not making known another gospel. You're making known the true gospel in your family. In your marriage, to your children, to your friends, your neighbors, your your school brethren. 
What are you really making known? To make known means to reveal. Let me read this quote here. There's a couple of quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy. You don't have them on the screen. Um, if you want them, I'll, you can come to me later. This is the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 907. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It says, The gospel is glorious because it is made up of his righteousness. It is, that's the gospel, it is Christ unfolded. And Christ is the gospel embodied. He is the good news. It's not religious words. This is Christ's Object Lessons, page 128. It says, the law is the gospel embodied. You should have just paralleled two things in your mind. And the gospel is the law unfolded. Why? Because doesn't it begin with grace? Doesn't it begin with salvation? Aren't each of the Ten Commandments a promise from God to you that you shall not steal? And that you shall not commit adultery? Why? Because Christ in you, the hope of glory. Every single one of them are promises. And Paul knew that by experience. Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 563. It says, The gospel of Christ is the good news of grace, or favor, by which man may be released from the condemnation of sin and enabled to render obedience to the law of God. Not for salvation, in salvation. Don't let anybody ever tell you that sin and evidence preached the law for salvation. That's ridiculous. That's a lie. That is another gospel. I don't preach that stuff. It's legalism. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 106. The message proclaimed by the angel flying in the midst of heaven, Revelation 14, is the everlasting gospel, the same gospel that was declared in Eden when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What verse is that? Genesis 3.15. So that's the same gospel then as it is where? Now. now. Skipping a few verses, it says, Christ was both the law and the gospel. It says, the angel proclaims, the everlasting gospel proclaims the law of God. For this gospel of salvation brings men to obedience of the law, whereby their characters are formed after the divine similitude or sameness. Wasn't that what was happening to Paul? He thought he was righteous. He thought he had the law memorized and all that stuff. But what was he? A sinner. What did he be? Jesus. Jesus Christ. And once he had him, then it was when he truly began keeping God's law. When he truly began experiencing that same character and demonstrating it. So the first word in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, Paul. What was his name before? Saul. Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus, Tarsus right? Do you know what Saul means? I looked this up. I found this fascinating. What does Saul mean? Who, who knows? Who thinks they know? <laughs> I'll tell you what it means. First of all, he was named after the king of Israel, right? First king of Israel. That's not a really great name to be named after, by the way. <laughs> right? One who blasphemed the Holy Spirit away and grieved away, right? It means beginning from littleness or, or grieves away the Holy Spirit. It means desiring, asking for, or practicing beggary. So what was Saul before? He was a beggar. That's what his name meant. And Tarsus literally means a flat basket. And he didn't realize that's what he was. But that's what his name meant. A beggar with nothing in his basket. In the book of Acts and so on, and I'm not going to quote every verse here, I'll just read it to you. In Philippians chapter 3, it says that Saul, as touching the law, he was what? A Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. There are many zealous people in the church. But they persecute other people. Say mean things, do mean things. They're unforgiving, unkind, unthankful, unholy, right? As touching righteousness, which is in the law of blindness, so he thought. Well, I haven't murdered anybody today, therefore I'm holy. 
Saul was a Roman, freeborn citizen, Acts 22, 28, born of Tarsus in Cilicia, raised at the feet of Gamaliel, Acts 5, 34, and 9, 11, born a Jew of the physical circumcision, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, Philippians 3, 5, an Israelite of the physical seed of Abraham, of the small tribe of Benjamin, Romans 11, 1, and raised and living as a Pharisee, Acts 26, 5, who witnessed the stoning of the martyr who? Stephen, and was consenting to it, Acts 8, 1 and 22, 20. And having had persecuted, he was called a blasphemer in persecuting the saints greatly, Acts 11, 19. And he was asking, what was his name meaning? Beggar, asking, but what was he asking to do? He was asking for letters to the synagogue to seek out to destroy those of the way. So even his name still meant beggar then. He was still asking for permission. And that's in Acts 9 2, noticed as a sect, Acts 24 5 and 28 22, of the Nazarene, called Christians in Acts 11 26. But he recounts this in Galatians chapter 1. Ooh, that turned purple. Can we go back up a few verses to verse 13 and 14? There's a little arrow right, right where it says Judea. You can just scroll if you want. Verses 13 and 14. One more. Right there. It's good. It says, For ye have heard of my what? Conversation. Or conduct in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure, notice, couldn't even measure, you lost count. Have you lost count how many times you said something mean to somebody? Or done something wrong? You've lost count, right? I've lost count. I can't count anymore. That's Paul. That's us. How that beyond measure I persecuted the Jew of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, because it is past, he says, I am the least of the apostles. Do you recognize yourself as least? Do you recognize yourself as least? Or do you think I'm everything there is? I'm the goat, the greatest of all time, right? He says, I was not even meet to be called an apostle. You recognize that you're sin. A little more and I'll be done. Paul had become born of the Holy Spirit. Notice this. I want to read these out. Listen to this. Saul, before Christ, he was a physical Jew. Are you a physical set of the evidence why I was born into the faith? It's not enough. Of the stock of the physical circumcision, of the physical seed of Abraham, a Pharisee, a freeborn Roman, a kingdom of earth. He was raised at the feet of Gamaliel, a man, a teacher of traditions of the fathers. He was consenting to the death of Christians, seeking out to destroy Christians through persecution, through his words, through his actions. That was the old man of Paul, known as Saul. But when he became a son of God in Christ Jesus, now Christ was with him, now he's what? A spiritual Jew. He's of the vine of the spiritual circumcision. He's of the spiritual seed of Abraham of faith. He's a Christian, apostle, a citizen of New Jerusalem, the kingdom of heaven, no longer of earth. He's raised in a new life to be at the feet of Jesus, the teacher of righteousness. He seeks the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and love, suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. Against such there is no law. Seeking to save the souls of men by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, no longer persecuting another. Don't go along to your brethren and say, ha ha, you sin. Look what you're doing. Look upon your own life. Look upon your own goodness. And seek the grace of God. Seek to become transformed. Seek the new name. Seek the kingdom of God. Seek the real and everlasting gospel, and then you can live it out before others. I want you to think on the book of Galatians and think, have I been given that new name? Has Paul been given that new name? Do I demonstrate that character? In my family, the home, my marriage, the church, school, my job, wherever. What gospel am I preaching to the world? Because the Bible says that this gospel is for a witness in the whole world, and then the end shall come. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray and ask God, you would please bless your word may be in the heart of every one of them, that everyone may be transformed by, by thy grace, by thy power. May the Holy Spirit be with them, sealing them for thy kingdom. 
and may be yours forever and ever. Pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we have our closing hymn. It is a new hymn you've probably never heard before, but the tune is simple. But I thought it matched the message, so we'll try it. We'll see how it goes. Songs of thankfulness and praise.